The Ryan and Russ Show is brought to you by Vision Homes. If you're looking to build a home in North Central West Virginia, visit askvisionhomes.com. Vision Homes, building you a house you're proud to call home. And don't forget to subscribe to The Ryan and Russ Show, but don't take our word for it. Take Coach Neelan's. Hi, this is Coach Don Neelan, and you're watching The Ryan and Russ Show. Please subscribe. <laughs> And we welcome you into another edition of the Ryan and Russ Show, your source for West Virginia sports. We got a special episode today, and we will bring our guests forward. Already a Morgantown favorite. He's already been here, what, a year now? But hey, he might as well have been here 10, it seems like. Coach Kellogg, thank you so much for coming on the show. It is our pleasure to have you here. We know you're in the middle of a lot of things, but thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be here. Yeah, no, appreciate it, guys. I've, uh, I've followed along in my year and see you guys on social media and all of that. So uh, I guess the pleasure is all mine to to get the call to be on. So appreciate it, guys. Appreciate it, Coach. And so before we talk uh, next year's Mountaineer team, I want to rewind back to your playing days. You played at Austin College. Uh, you were a guard, obviously. Talk about your playing career and just how that set you up for the coaching profession and success so far in the coaching industry. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out though how you obviously thought I was a guard. <laughs> maybe, 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 you know, yeah. it might be a giveaway. Oh uh, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. I was a I was a scoring point guard is really what I was. Or if you ask some teammates, I probably jacked a lot of threes. Would maybe even be a way to to describe my game. But yeah, I, I mean, I grew up in Dallas and played at a pretty big high school, and really on it was going to walk on at TCU is really what I thought I was going to do for Billy Tubbs was the coach. If you guys remember Billy Tubbs ended up play, coaching at Oklahoma and a few different places, but, and that probably would have been a disaster. Like that would not have been a good fit. Um, and then a small school, Austin college called and yeah, I had a great career and left as like the third or fourth all time leading scorer and was a finalist for the division three player of the year as a senior. So had a great career and then got my master's and started coaching on the men's side. Um, but then the lady that was coaching at Austin College, of course, on the women's team, got the head coaching job at Montana State. Um, and I had gotten to know her through my playing career. Um, and then she asked me to go be an assistant at, I don't know, probably 24 years old or something like that to go be a Division One assistant on the women's side. And so I did. I went to Montana State and had no idea where I was going. And that's north of Yellowstone National Park, which I thought was probably like in Canada or something at the time, you know, but I didn't have any other options. And so I did it. And yeah, been on the women's side ever since and probably would not go coach men now or um, if I had the opportunity. Well, hey, you're, you are where you're meant to be and you, you yeah. do a fantastic job, coach. But kind of speaking to that, you know, you were on the men's side as a GA at, at West Texas A&M. And then, like you said, you, you you follow another coach over to Montana State for four years. Um, talk about that transition from the men's game to the women's game. What were some of the hurdles you had to face um were there any unexpected challenges or were there some things where it's like hey actually kind of like what you were alluding to I actually like this about the women's game way better than the men's yeah you know I think and this is going to be very much a generalization so don't hold me completely to this but on the men's side you're co you're coaching egos they always tend to think they're better than they are and the women is sometimes the opposite where I need to build them up and they're they're a little more emotional of course and it's kind of personality driven um, and the guys is very much kind of ego based and, you know, toughness and um, but basketball is basketball at the same time. And so I truly feel like I get to coach them. Um, you know, I, I kind of like to joke, too, that I don't really worry about getting too many phone calls in the middle of the night because my kids aren't doing something, you know, that they're supposed to do and they make good grades. And so very rarely are we worried about, you know, an academic issue. So we don't you know, like those things take care of themselves, which allows me to really just truly focus on them as, you know, as the people, the program, the X and O side of it, you know, anything that, you know, like the, the CEO or head coach, you know, kind of has to do, but takes my time away from, from the other stuff and, and really allows me to focus. Um, so I, I, I've, I've enjoyed the women's side, had a couple opportunities early in my career to go back on the men's side and just, and didn't do it. And it's, um, I, I think we've been all right. Yeah, absolutely. So, Coach, let me ask you this. Uh, every assistant coach wants to be a head coach, and, and every assistant coach has all the ideas. And then when you become the head coach, well, it, it, those ideas maybe aren't the best ideas anymore, and you don't have as many ideas. So you're a head coach just seven years after your playing career ends at Fort, Fort Lewis College in Colorado. You won 80% of your games there. Just talk about the transition of being a young head coach and the transition from being an assistant coach to head coach. 
Yeah, and you're right. I was only I was only an assistant. I mean, those two years as a graduate assistant, and then four years at at Montana State. And uh, the last year, the head coach got let go, so we were interim coaches for a year. And um, you know, that actually ended up being a pretty good situation for me. I thought I wanted that job, um, like the interim job, and they were like, "No, coach, you don't like Mark. You don't want this. Like that's not good for you and your career." And of course, I'm young at the time and think I can do it. And now I look back and think, "Thank the Lord I didn't <laughs> get that opportunity." Um, but yeah, I, I want I at that point when you've gone through those things as a young coach, I thought maybe my best path is to go kind of call the shots. Um, and again, you're young and you have all these great ideas, but implementing them. Um, you know, and getting people to buy into it is not nearly as easy when you're, we always say those six inches from assistant to head coach is, is totally yeah. different. Um, but what Fort Lewis did for me was really allow me to, if I made mistakes, there weren't a ton of eyes on us at the time. Um, because that was actually, I was the third coach in three years there as well. Um, they had only been to one NCAA tournament in their school's history. Um, so there, I think I had four scholarships, maybe four and a half when I got that job, I wasn't making any money. I was teaching four classes, having to fundraise, like for, I felt like half the program was going to be fundraised money. Uh, we took vans to, to games, you know, so you're driving over mountain passes in Colorado. And my favorite story is I got tired of doing that. So I was determined to find a driver, but we didn't have any vehicles to drive. So like in Durango, Colorado, which is absolutely gorgeous, there's the river, right? Water rafting that goes right through the middle of the town, similar, you know, kind of here with the river, but this one was a whitewater rafting river. Well, there was a company called Mile to Wild Rafting. And so in the winter, they don't use those buses to transport, you know, the rafters. So they're just sitting there. So I went and called the company. I was like, hey, I would rent those from you in the winter and I'll hire a driver that has their CDL to take our team. So I think it was my second or third year, maybe my third year, we won the league and we rolled up to games in a bus that said mile to wild rafting <laughs> on the side of it. Um, you know, but you just get creative and you learn how to coach and you learn what your philosophy is. And a lot of the way we play with our press and, you know, zone was developed at Fort Lewis College when I got to experiment. And if we lost a game, there weren't that many eyes on it, especially early when we were figuring it out. And then we got to be pretty good. And so you got more eyes on you. But um, really allowed me to grow up as a head coach. Yeah. And hey, you went to a to a national championship for a school that uh, had only what one tournament appearance before that. So it, it, it definitely worked out for you. And, you know, even before you got your first division one uh, coaching gig at, at Stephen F. Austin, you know, you coached Northwest Missouri State where you you, you met a, a, a familiar face here in Morgantown. We'll, we'll talk about him later in our athletic director. Uh, but you also went to te West Texas A&M. Um, you finished up you know, runner up again, uh, at, and you know, you're doing three schools, two of those gigs, you know, you're going to the national championship, you're in different locations, you have different cultures, you have different players, et cetera, et cetera. How do you maintain that, that type of excellence? Like it, it definitely speaks to your coaching ability that, you know, you're at your third division two school and you're taking another team to the, to the national championship. Yeah. Well, I mean, so sustained success is one of my mantras and I think it's, one of the hardest things to do in collegiate athletics is to sustain it year in and year out. I think it, it becomes very cyclical at times where you see a team that maybe gets old and they have two good years and all those kids graduate and they take a step back and kind of have to build it back up. And, and I really never wanted to be that team. I wanted to sustain it year in and year out. And yeah, fortunately we went to the right places with the right people. Um, a lot of that has to do as a coach with your administration. And we may talk about, you know, Ren and that, you know, connection later, but your administration is what allows coaches to have success. And then you got to get a staff and players, you know, to build off of now, like at Fort Lewis, I only had one assistant, like that was it, like no GAs, no nothing. It was me and one other person. And so I laugh about that today when I look at my staff and see all these people <laughs> around to think that back in the day we did this with, with two people. Um, but you really get to know people on, on a really deep level and, um, you know, West Texas really is a like run like a division one program. They just play underneath the division two umbrella. And and I had been there and felt very comfortable there. And it was back, you know, in Texas where I, you know, had kind of started mm -hmm. my coaching career on the men's side. Mm -hmm. And so that one felt pretty natural um, for me. And then the Stephen F. Austin was, you know, like a top three job in the league, maybe the best job in the league. And that's I wasn't going to leave West Texas unless it was for a situation like that. So went to East Texas to Stephen F. Austin and, and had a lot of success and um, again, learned how to coach at the division one level and figured out how to have a bigger staff and recruit a little bit better athletes. And, um, and then of course the opportunity came eight years later to come here. 
Yeah, absolutely. And kind of a common theme everybody watching right now is, is you've won wherever you've gone. We're going step by step. So you go to Stephen F. Austin. It's your first Division One head job. You guys started the Southland, and like you said, it was the best best job in that league. But then you guys transition over to the WAC as well your last two years. Just your eight years where you won just uh, south of 200 games in that short amount of time. Just talk about the experience there and, and how it's prepared you for success already at West Virginia. Yeah, uh, well, it, honestly, and it, Stephen F., it, it wasn't a very easy – it was rocky. Like, it was the hardest two years of my coaching career. Like, it was – it was rough, rough, you know, like, is this what I'm supposed to do? Um, you know, had a, a, a difficult team that I just couldn't get through early on um, and really had to kind of almost wait. Now we won some games on the court. So the record probably looks okay. You know, I think it was 18 yeah. and 12 and then whatever we were the second year, won 20 plus games, you know, in the second year. And it may look like it was great, but it really wasn't. I mean, it was a difficult, difficult transition. Um, and then though, by year three, four, you know, you've kind of now settled in, got your staff, right. Got your players, you know, that were buying into what we were kind of selling. And then the res results really kind of started to take off and, um, you know, had to battle through COVID those couple years. I thought we had a really good team the year we got shut down. Um, the following year we went to the NCAA tournament and really should have beat Georgia tech. You know, I think we were up 17 at half and ended up losing the, in overtime, um, you know, and then ironically, Georgia Tech beat West Virginia the next round to go to the Sweet 16, and we were all down there together. And and then we moved to the WAC, which changed everything, the way you travel, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and, ha and almost go undefeated. So we lose one game, I think, back-to-back -back years, you know, in our leagues um, and, and get to go back to the tournament and go to Arizona and play North Carolina and lead after the first quarter at half, lead after the third quarter, and then just couldn't quite, you know, get that done. But you know, the whack was interesting, guys, because like no one realized we were in Nacogdoches two and a half hours from an airport. Right. So we're flying commercially everywhere. So a weekend road trip for us would be say we would go play Cal Baptist, which is in Riverside, California, on a Thursday night. So we're leaving Wednesday. You go, you know, you got to leave four hours early, you know, because you're in a group to get to the airport an hour and a half at least before, you know, then you fly out there. You play on a Thursday night, stay the night fly to Seattle, Washington, because that's their travel partner. Travel partner. You know, you're playing them on, at one o'clock on a Saturday, and then you're waiting to take the red eye home. So then we're taking the red eye back to Houston from Seattle. So we're getting back home on Sunday morning at nine or 10 a.m. after you land and bus again. And then, you know, those kids had to go play again. And so it was just the travel was brutal in the league. The league was more competitive at the time than the Southland. Um, but it certainly challenged our players on a physical, mental level that I've never, never been a part of. We'll be back with Coach Kellogg in a second, but first a reminder that the Ryan and Russ Show is brought to you by 1111 Media. If you run a small business and want to get more customers, talk to the local marketing experts at 1111 Media. Visit 11-11.media. That's 11-11.media to learn more and get a free strategy session for your business. 1111 Media, helping small businesses get more customers. But yeah, Coach, I mean, that's Ryan's talked about it too when he spent some time out in Austin P. is you were talking about it earlier with the bus situation and then the travel situation, those, you know, smaller schools and, and, and you know, not the non-power schools, especially, you know, at, at maybe at the women's level, you know, compared to the football team or the men's team is you got to get very creative. And there's just times where I'm sure that Monday morning comes around and, and hits hard and you're just like, Oh, let's, let's just do it again. It, it, it's actually incredible how, you know, with that being said, you know, you have a, uh, it, school in California, their travel partners in, in Seattle, um, that you were able to be that successful. I mean, how, how do you keep that team just, just going? Yeah. Well, consistency. And that's kind of been my mantra too, you know, is just kind of be the same guy every day, not too high, not too low. And, you know, I never want to walk into practice and have the players look at me to kind of see what kind of mood is coach Kellogg in thinking that's going yeah. to determine how the practice goes. You know, and so I, I just never wanted that. And so I want to be the right guy. And it doesn't mean I don't maybe get a little more upset after losses or that film session might sound a little different than than after a win. Uh, but again, you just can't get too high and you can't get really too low. And so it was, yeah, prepare, really take notice on how their bodies are, you know, how they're feeling. There may be days that, you know, normally might be a real practice that we just had to walk through or we would call them mental days and it would be more film and free only free throws. Like there were plenty of practices that was we would watch film as a team. We would prepare the scouting report. We'd walk out there and either get some shots up or free throws. And we went home and just uh, mm -hmm. trusted our kids to buy into the game plan and they would go out and execute. But 
again, I, we typically had what I called program kids, kids that have been in your program for multiple, multiple years. Um, and by the time they're juniors and seniors, they know everything you're trying to do anyway, or they've probably seen a similar game plan at some point and could go execute. And, uh, but that was the battle is how do we keep them fresh for March? Uh, meaning the most important, especially at the mid-major level when your only chance for the most part is to win those two or three games in the conference tournament. And that pressure was felt what it felt like even at the division two level, we played for national championships. And I felt like the same pressure was on those kids for a conference tournament at the mid-major level. Yeah. And you, so you take that pressure that from any level, right? Division two, heck, when, when you played even your first division one gig, right. And you come to, to West Virginia, your, your old athletic directors, the, the athletic director here, you come to a power school and well, you took over for, for a, a coach that, no, everyone understood that, that, you know, she wanted to go somewhere else and be closer to her family. Everyone gets that, you know, we all got to do our own thing, but people were really upset with the way she, she said goodbye. And, you know, before that you had Mike Carey here, who's was an incredible coach here at West Virginia, not only for West Virginia, but you know, for, for women's basketball, the history of women's college basketball. So you, you come in here, what was talk about like that transition? What it was like, how Ren reaches out to you, you talk to your family, you know, you feel good about it. You come here, maybe not saying that anyone was blaming you for, you know, what transpired with the former regime, but you know, it did leave a bad taste in people's mouths and, you know, you want to get that out of people's mouths and, you know, ready to go again. Yeah. Well, I, I think the process, if we go back to that point was, you know, it was right around the final four, actually, I was at the national championship. I remember talking to Ren Baker when it was pretty much had been offered maybe earlier that day and we were going through some details, but I was leaving the, the women's national championship game to go up to talk at like this Budweiser little hut area that was kind of quiet to, to have the conversation with Ren. Um, but yeah, no, Ren and I have ke had kept up with each other. Now, Ren was only at Northwest Missouri State for six months and I was only there a year, but he yeah. hired me. And then in about December, he had left. Um, and so by the time my season ended, Ren was no longer there. So I had not seen Ren Baker since the day he left Northwest Missouri State um, until the day I interviewed, which was in Dallas at the Final Four. But we had kept in touch throughout the years, you know, maybe a couple times and just picking each other's brains, um, those types of things. Um, and so, you know, certainly that helped. There's some familiarity, um, you know, but it was a, it was a no brainer. Like, so it wasn't a, you know, I never came to, I didn't come to Morgantown. I didn't come to West Virginia through the interview process. It was offered and Ren said, hey, do you need to? Do you need to come to say yes? And I was like, no, we do not. Um, family was on board. We were good to nice. go. Um, and then literally, you know, it's about 24 hours later and you're on the plane and you say goodbye to your team. And that's always emotional. And then there's the excitement of, of taking over. Um, and so I, I think to answer your question, too, there's always this excitement, but there's this unknown when you're taking over a program. There's a real unknown when you're the third coach in three years. And what are those players going to do that were already here that had some talent? And so job number one was to win them over try to understand what type and type of emotion they were going through. Um, you know, and I think as it turned out, they were, they love it here. Um, that's obviously, I think why they stayed. I, I, I hope it was somewhat of the coach Kellogg vision that they believed in really quickly that they saw that they could have success and, and what we were going to sell here and, and what we wanted to accomplish. Um, but I think at the same time, they wanted to be loved and they wanted to be cared for it. And they wanted to have a coach that was going to stay and, and let them know that it was going to be okay and that we would still get them, you know, allow them to accomplish the goals that they wanted to. And so really credit to the players last summer. They bought in. They became close, close, close last summer. And it wasn't Coach Kellogg forcing the issue, you know, because which we do, you know, we'll force the team bondings and we'll force the mm -hmm. events and we'll take them on the retreats. And we went whitewater rafting and we did all of those things. But it was them when it happens organically, it's way better, way better. And the players did it organically. And I thought that got us a head start early was because they were so bought into each other and to what we were doing that that allowed us to kind of maybe springboard a little quicker than probably anybody was expecting. Absolutely. You, you led me right into the next question I had was it's hard when you're taking over as a third coach in three years, because yeah, the players in your program are used to a certain terminology, a, a way of doing things. You guys play unique the way that you play with pressuring the basketball 94 feet what was it like trying to mold a team in that's played for multiple coaches? I know it's, we're in the transfer portal era, and it, that's, I guess, more common now. But what was that like for you and your staff in your first year just battling the, those unique circumstances? Yeah, and honestly, probably not quite as difficult as you might think uh, because I thought it really fit. And 
the fit came from, I think, a couple of things. So Coach Carey was a lot of what we were defensively, though. He, and we mm -hmm. did it differently, but he had recruited to pressure and athleticism and defense and toughness, and that was a lot of his identity. And then Don was much more, though, in the half court. Offensively, Don is motion offense, reads. You know, they do a great job on the offensive end. And here comes Coach Kellogg, who I actually am a little bit of both of those. So here's our defense. So you see a little bit of carry there. We just put our stamp on it, right? We are some motion offense like Don was. Um, you know, and then we play a little bit more zone, which neither of them did. So that's where it got a little different was we had to teach them some zone stuff that these kids hadn't probably ever really been taught before. Um, but outside of that, no, they, they had bought in. There were some talented players here. So we were fortunate to take over a, a team that had been to the tournament, um, you know, and, and had some good depth. And we had to add some, you know, Lauren Fields and some kids that had experience. Obviously, Jordan Harrison comes with me and just completely takes over and runs the show. So you know, I had a couple coaches that came with me and Jordan and Zion Nugent who didn't get to play because she had gotten hurt. But so the hardest part was just getting everybody on the same page and teaching staff and players what this is supposed to look like. But man, everybody caught on really quick. Yeah. So you have an excellent regular season in uh, your first year at West Virginia. Obviously, you get to Selection Sunday, uh, the NCAA, as they like to do to West Virginia, or we feel like they like to do to West Virginia, uh, does us no favors. Uh, we were thinking here in Morgantown, you all would be a, a six or seven seed, but nope, uh, you're going to be the eighth seed. And if you win, you got Caitlin Clark in Iowa uh, right on deck for you. Uh, but nonetheless, that doesn't bother you. Obviously, the, the infamous video comes out. I remember logging on one day and I think I went to Fox News and I'm like, why is Coach Kellogg on one of the headline pages? We all know, we all obviously know that 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 video was supposed to get out. It wasn't like you're doing a press conference or anything and trying to stir stuff up. But you know, we are in the the social media era, and everyone has a camera phone era. So, two questions there is obviously, what did you think about when it got a lot more uh, national that vid, uh, than than you, you intended it to? And also, like more importantly, is how do you stay focused against Princeton when you know you're kind of like you know, we got Caitlin Clark on deck. We're in Iowa. Like, but Hey, we, we got to get there first. Right. How do you, how do you maintain that focus? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, honestly, when it came, I was not very happy to be completely honest. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. out. Like I was I not happy at all. Um, <laughs> and if you know me, like I, that's not really my personality. It's like, not at all. It really right? wasn't intent. That's not who I am. Um, and, and so I really was kind of bothered and, um, you know, and, and it was a public setting and I guess, you know, you could take that, but I thought it was our people and, I was doing like the true press conference at the end of it, you know, and we went over there and I, there's all the cameras and now I know what I say is going out there. And so I was just trying to rally the the crowd a little bit, but actually somebody in the crowd had already kind of said that like, you know, like, Hey, well, all right, we got to go to Iowa and, you know, send Caitlin back or something along those lines. So I just took it. I'm like, I'll spread that to the, to the masses. Yeah. And then that clip kind of get, got drunk and shrunk, you know how that works. But then when I got to my team, they loved it, guys. Like they thought it was yeah. great. And so at that point, I'm like, okay, well, like, let's just roll with this. You know, we're going to roll with yeah. it. And we'll, you know, honestly, I, I, there was a part of me that really wanted to go to my pre like real press conference the next day with like to go print a shirt with like a luggage and then like maybe Caitlin's little head coming out of the <laughs> you know, or something just to yeah. like, at this point, we might as well just go all, <laughs> let's just, let's yeah. just double down on this thing and have some fun with it. But you know, then there was like some maintenance. And I was like, all right, I'll pull back here a little bit. I don't need to, yeah. you know, you know, poke the bear any more than I guess I just did. But our players loved it. And then, you know, people brought that up about Princeton, but never for a second were we looking past Princeton. Mm -hmm. And in that, you know, when I was talking to everybody too, I did talk first about Princeton and how much respect we had for them. And the last two years, they had won their first round matchup against a power five opponent. So I had talked about all that. Of course, nobody saw that on the video because that wasn't what was put out there. And and so I never, ever, ever felt like we were looking to Iowa. Uh, but I was really, I was bothered by our seat, if I was being completely honest. Mm -hmm. Like I was shocked that we fell that far. I thought for sure, probably six, you know, we had seen stuff five or seven. So I'm like, all right, probably six. Um, never saw eight coming if I was being honest. And then you get Iowa. And so at first, you know, you're like, oh, well, man, that pass this week 16 just got really difficult. And we had Princeton yeah. first. And then it became a no, let's go take advantage of this opportunity. What a cool platform. We know there's going to be a ton of eyes. You know, then we started thinking through like, man, that's going to be Caitlin Clark's last two games at home. Can you imagine what that environment will be like? So we prepared perfectly for Princeton. We hadn't talked one bit about Iowa. Um, and I thought our kids did a great job, especially in that third quarter against Princeton to kind of take over. And then the best thing though, was what I, I, we should have had like cameras recording our whole 
preparation for Iowa because it was off the charts good. Our players were phenomenal. Like we didn't really practice that day between. We, it was all walk through. And so you're trying to walk through to get ready for the our you know game's greatest score of all time and the most efficient offense that we've seen in 15 years. And now you're asking us to do this in less than 48 hours with a walkthrough and, um, and a game plan. But, oh, man, we had the whiteboard full as coaches. And we had every analytic you could think of and things that we were going to do with Caitlin and the rest of the team. And, you know, really bought into that defensively, which I thought obviously we defended them better than anybody did probably in the whole country. And, you know, we weren't great offensively, and that's probably a little disappointing. And maybe I wish I could have prepared us because they played a bunch of triangle and two on Jordan and JJ, and we were prepared for that. And we knew they would, um, you know, but I don't know that we handled it as well as, as I would have liked to. Now we still got open looks. We just didn't make them. And so, you know, as a coach too, you, you know, you, you just want to get your kids open shots, but probably needed to help Jordan and JJ a little bit more on the offensive end. Cause we defended well enough to win that game. Absolutely. And not to go down the whole Caitlin Clark thing. I mean, she, everywhere you turn, she, she's in the in the news, whether she be on Team USA or or not, that whole debate, whatever. Yeah. But what was beneficial to your guys' program is you got to be on that stage playing Caitlin Clark in her last game in Iowa City. And I think everybody walked away saying, man, th th that West Virginia program, that they guard their tails off, they could beat their asses off. Uh, this is a fun program to watch. How do you – parlay that into momentum into next year based off of that 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 national scene that you guys played so well i i think you should have won the game and maybe there were some other factors that went into it maybe some agendas but we that was me saying that not you but just talk about <laughs> the momentum you could take from that game uh with your program coach yeah no yeah i know guy we did we took a ton of momentum from it and what we had, I think we had 5 million, some, you know, something like that yeah. viewers watching that game, which was the third most watched women's game ever, I think at the time. And it outdrawn every men's game through the whole tournament. So we got a lot of eyes and really honestly what it did. I mean, so, I mean, some of it's even been small. So like we have camp going on right now, last year we had 61 kids. I think at camp now we're at like 200 or more kids in camp nice. right now, you know, like ton of momentum there ton. When I was going out on the caravans this summer, like a summer ago, I'm like having to like cold call, introduce myself to everybody at these caravans. They have no idea who Mark Kellogg is or what I'm selling. And this year felt way different. You know, people are coming up to me. We saw you on TV, man. Congratulations. And then like the recruiting is what's changed probably quite a bit where it used to be a 10 minute, you know, intro when you call a recruit to, oh, here's Coach Kellogg. Do you know where West Virginia is? No. Yeah. Have you ever heard about our program? Eh, not really. You know, and so it would take a while to go through what we want. And now it was about a 20 second, man, I watched y'all play Iowa. I love the way you play coach, man. I would love to play with those elite guards that you have. I mean, it would be things, you know, like that, that really that 10 minute conversation went to them telling me, you know, 20 seconds worth of how much they enjoyed watching us. So, you know, I think it helps them in the transfer portal. Um, it helps when we're recruiting high school kids right now. Um, it just gets the conversation going much quicker and easier. Um, now we still got some work to do and we've got to get over the hump in some areas and, uh, beat some of these teams that are just a little more established than us on the recruiting trail. And so that will be the next step for us, but we certainly have momentum and we're certainly closer today than we were a year ago when I got here. Let us right into our next question, coach is obviously you got to move into next year, right? You got to, you got to flush the past, you know, behind you. Um, how you've been on the trail a lot. You've been recruiting, you're retaining a ton of talent. This team looks very promising this year. What's your message to Mountaineer nation about uh, this year coming up? Yeah, well, I hope we, we you know, just continue to, you know, I guess let me put it this way. Our little saying has been, it's just the beginning. Like, I don't want it to be defined by what we did in year one, right? This needs to be the beginning of the of the process for us. And um, But expectations are going to change. Goals are going to change. You know, standards are going to change and what we expect to do, you know, late in the year. But we've got to continue the journey. And that's what was so much fun this year is there really weren't a ton of expectations. So we truly enjoyed it. Can we still enjoy it when the expectations are where they will probably be. And so that will be our biggest hurdle and challenge. But yeah, you, you guys are right. You're right. We return a lot. We return an All-American player. Yeah. We have our point guard back. You know, four of our five starters are back. Six of our top eight. I really like the kids we've added. So we've gotten a little bit more size, got a little more girth in there. We've got more bodies in the post. Um, you know, got some experience um, at the guard position. So um, you know, we've gotten healthy with two kids that were out last year. We'll be back. So, yeah, it, it looks like we're in a really, really good place. But we also understand the margins at this level are really small, mm -hmm. really, really small. Um, you know, and we found that out a little bit, losing overtime games, the Baylor loss at home. You know, there was 
it could have flipped and it could have looked even different for us one way or the other. So our schedule will be a little bit better. Non-conference schedule will be a little different and a little bit little tougher. So we're going to challenge them. I think that's where our program is at right now. I expect us to continue. I hope this is just the beginning. Um, you know, we finished with the second highest attendance in our school's history in year one. So what am I asking? Come on, Mountaineer Nate. Like, let's go. Like, let's get in. Let's Break get in the, the policy and let's support this team. They're fun to watch. It's a fun group. You know, the, the great kids. I mean, you should see all the little kids at camp. Their eyes just get huge when our players walk in and they're signing autographs for, you know, 30, 45 minutes after camp today. And they'll do it again this afternoon for the second session. So I, I just think it's really healthy right now. Our program is in such a good place and we just want people to, to get to be a part of it and help continue and uh, build um, what we've started. Absolutely. And, and and you mentioned it with, with, with kind of back to the Iowa, Iowa game question with NIL being such a big thing now in college athletics, how do you guys go about just keeping it? You're, you're going from the kind of the hunter to the hunted. It's a lot easier being the hunter than the hunted flying under the radar. Now that you are a little bit more in the spotlight as a staff, do you guys talk about that, how to manage that with your team? Just how do you guys go about that as you head into uh, year number two? Yeah. Well, I think the identity of your team kind of dictates a little bit of what conversations you have. Um, I don't know that with our team, like every time I've kind of tried to not really question them, but maybe I want more from them or I don't think their energy is any good or whatever. Maybe if they're almost always like, coach, relax. And they don't say that, but that's what their body language is telling me. And then I do. Um, like my example was when we were going into the third quarter at Iowa, I guess the fourth quarter, end of the third quarter, we they had just gone on that like 10-0 run or whatever. They had gone up 10. And literally I got into that huddle and it was like, coach, we got this. Like, guys, we've been here before. We're going to answer right now. We know what we have to do. And they're basically telling me. And I was prepared to go in there like, you got 10 minutes. Sweet 16's on the line. You worked all da 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 And it was more like, coach, don't. Like, we don't need it, you know. And so I don't yeah. – again, I'll get the pulse of the team throughout the summer, but I don't know how much rah-rah this group. I think they know. They know what's at stake. They know what they want to accomplish. And we haven't got together to set those goals. I don't really think the summer's – really the time for that. I want them to be a little more relaxed right now. Mm -hmm. We're in the gym. We have the foreign trip coming up. And so we had our first official practice Monday and that looks even a different for me. Like I'm not like our season is so long. I, I want to keep them so mentally and physically fresh this time of year that they're excited to come in our building every day and work. You know, I use the BU align with us all the time. Just, I want them to be themselves and whatever that looks like to them right now, I think it's great, um, but our kids are self-motivators. We're going to have those conversations and we're going to set the bar high, but I'm also careful too. Like if you say you're going to win the big 12 championship and you finish second, are we supposed to feel bad? Like we didn't have a great year, you know, and then you just got second in the big 12, which is a crazy league. So, you know, I think we're going to be a little careful in what some of those goals are, but I, I know our dreams are pretty big and we're going to do everything we can to do something special. The women's game is clearly growing coach as I mean, you've probably just seen being in it, you know, that we started talking about, you know, the nineties, two thousands to, to today, you know, they're getting the resources and opportunities that, you know, they haven't gotten in the past. What's your message to, you know, maybe sports fans or basketball fans that may have not made the jump to the women's game yet. Yeah. Well, I think there's two ways to look at it. I think the women's game is still the truest form of basketball. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's because uh, we don't rely on athleticism. So we have mm -hmm. to move the basketball and share it. And, you know, we're getting layups and it looks a little more fundamental at times. Um, now, that's a knock at times, too, because people want the men's athleticism and the high flying and the dunks and those yeah. types of things. But the women athletically have gotten so much better over the years. That's what I've seen. So this will be year 20 for me as a head coach and watching the things that they can do now that 10 years ago they couldn't do from just a straight athletic standpoint is night and day different. Um, but for us too, like that's important to me for the way we play because we want to make the game go faster. We want to be fun to watch. We want to create offense. We want to hit a bunch of threes. You know, we keep track of turnovers and announce it, you know, because we want the crowd to get into things that we are about or that are important to our program. So I think if you come give us a watch, you'll really fall in love with the product, with the players. You know, after the game, we do the victory lap and everybody comes down there and gets high fives. All the little kids can stay and get autographs. So I think one of the most important things in women's sports and in particular women's basketball to draw fans is the personal connection. Because a lot of times they won't come just to watch a game. They'll go just watch the men because the men are playing. No connection whatsoever. It's just men's basketball and mm -hmm. it's the athleticism and those types mm -hmm. of things. And because that's what everybody in the state has done for so long. Well, for us, we draw men differently. 
right? It's all these kids coming to camp are going to tell mom or dad they want to come and they're going to go down there on the floor and they're going to have a little JJ's jersey on with their autograph because they got it at camp, you know, or whatever yeah. the case may be is the personal connection for us is what people come. But when you come watch us, you'll see that. You'll see the, you know, camaraderie amongst the girls and how tight they are and how much fun they have. And, you know, I use the word joy all the time last year. They're just, I enjoyed coaching them. They played with this joy. They were joy to be around. And so just, yeah, just, I think if you'll come watch, I think we'll draw you in and you'll continue to come and we'll grow this attendance and we'll end up having the greatest attendance that this school's ever seen. Awesome. No doubt. And, and coach, so every, we, we talked about every step along the way of your journey. Every coach needs a good support system. Your wife, Tricia, your two kids, <laughs> just talk about how you guys, um, it, first year in this community, Morgantown, it's small community that everybody knows everybody just talk about how, how cool it's been in year number one in Morgantown and living in the state of West Virginia, where West Virginia University and the Mountaineers are number one. Yeah, no, guy, truly, it's been exceptional. It has that was my biggest concern. I was never worried about me or the job and what it looks like, because that's what I've been doing. It was really mostly the women in my life because my son was all on board real quickly. When, when we yeah. came and did the press conference, they went back to finish school. And I think he wore a West Virginia shirt to school every day the rest of the year after we got this job. He was so excited yeah. to come. And my wife, I thought, was going to be fine, too. My daughter was the one I was the most worried about. She was going into her freshman year in high school and mm -hmm. going to change AU teams. And so I really was taking out of her out of her comfort zone and everything that she had known. Um, but no, the people of West Virginia have, have been truly as advertised. They've been phenomenal, been very welcoming. Um, both kids had a great year, you know, academically, athletically. We had the kind of I called it the Kellogg run that we were on there in March in basketball, because on one Saturday, my daughter played for the state championship. The next Saturday, my son was on the Morgantown team that won the state championship. And then the next Saturday, we played Princeton in the first round of the NCAA tournament. So for a basketball <laughs> family, it didn't really get much better, you know, than that. Um, you know, the hard part for me is missing my kids activities, but that has nothing to do with, you know, here necessarily. It's just what I what I signed up for. But yeah, truly. And Ren had brought that up and that you're going to be the face of a, of a state as far as girls basketball, women's basketball is concerned. And, you know, how will that be? And it's been it's been fantastic. Um, that piece has been great. Ren talked a lot in the process about how great the people of West Virginia are. And I was a little hesitant because I think everybody says that, you know, through the recruiting interview process, mm -hmm. you know, and and no, it had, couldn't have been any more of the truth. And yeah, it's a very proud state and, you know, a very blue collar, hard worker, everything we want our program to be. And so we've tried to resonate that message um, as well. But no, we are extremely, extremely happy. Yeah. And congratulations to your son and daughter, too, on having very successful uh, seasons at Morgantown High. You know, uh, what would say championship for your son, state runner up for your daughter? That's the, really impressive. And then you talk about the schedule you just went through. Uh, hey, we we brought the the Kellogg family of champions to uh to, to Morgantown, I guess uh, with Kellogg, I'm sure people have had fun with your last name and Wheaties and Breakfast oh. Champions and all and well, all man. that. Yeah, of <laughs> course, of course. <laughs> but coach, we 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 really appreciate you coming on. Um, we know you're busy and you're in the middle of camp. So one last question for you: What's something uh, people would like that you would like people to know about you, and maybe they kind of don't know about you? Man, I don't know. I feel like most of it's probably out there now. Um, I don't. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no hidden agendas or anything like that. Just, to, you know, you just try to treat people right. Be, I'm, I'm a family guy, first and foremost. And, you know, my family's the most important. And we used to try to balance them. And now you just integrate them, you know, is what I learned years mm -hmm. ago as a head coach. You tried to balance your family life with your professional life. And that doesn't work in this world. So, you know, we just blend them together. But I think our team would tell you that, too. It's just a big, happy family. And, you know, I don't get a lot of time off. You might find me at the golf course, I guess, if if, if I did have a little bit of time. And my kids play there golf, so that's nice. That that's the fun. You know, that's fun for me to to get yeah. with them. Um, but yeah, no, really, I mean, nothing else. We've just we've enjoyed it here, and uh, want to continue to get to know everybody in this state and see if we can't build something that everybody's just super proud of. Coach, hey, and, thank and, you and, so much. And, and real quick before we depart, yep. Rush, I just want to thank Coach for bringing me back to the memories of running camp all those years. I can hear <laughs> oh. the buzzer in the background and it, and it's time to rotate station. So yeah, that, that's well, a good memory it. for you. Is Are you trying to tell me that's a good memory for you? Uh, no, you said the sarcasm. <laughs> I, I, the, best, the best part of camp was the first day and then the last day. With the I know. Well, we're, we're about an hour and 20 minutes away from that thing being over. And so, you know, as a, you just hope everybody stays healthy. We don't lose any kids and they have a no good doubt. time. They're going to get their little autographs and we're yep. going to give out the trophies. <laughs> So we have the little kids in the morning and some of them saw the trophies over there 
and uh-huh. about the only question I got all morning, and it was about 20 of them, was who are those trophies for, coach? <laughs> coach, who are those trophies for? And I'm like, hey, for the ones that have great attitudes and play hard and rebound. And it's like, keep yeah. working, and maybe your name will get called later. And uh, But that's – I mean, it's camps, and we do enjoy it. We do truly enjoy yeah. it. Our players work it, and they're they're fantastic at it. But we're also glad, no lie, Brian, when it's over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the coach's social after camp is over is uh, the best part of camp season. Uh, no doubt. No, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> coach thank you so much for coming on we really appreciate it look forward to seeing you around love to have you on before the season starts talk talk a little more but until then uh thank you for for all that you're doing and best of luck to you yeah thanks guys well done i always appreciate it and whenever you need me you just let me know all right we'll get back on thanks coach okay thanks coach go mountaineers